All right. 631, we better get going because we have a lot of composting things to talk about. So thank you for joining in for Composting 101 tonight. Um, it is beautiful outside, uh, but we'll have many beautiful days to enjoy coming up. Um, so my name is Cedar Walters and I work in the Otter Till County Solid Waste Department, but we also work with Todd County and Wadena County. Um, we have a shared management structure. Um, and so actually some of what I'm talking about tonight really is in, uh, in partnership with all three counties. I'm essentially a waste educator in Otter Till County. So I visit schools, do presentations, um, coordinate some community programs. Basically, I talk about garbage and recycling and composting all day, every day, which is, is pretty fun. So um, let's see, there'll be lots of opportunities towards the end. There'll be a whole Q&A at the end. So as we go through, feel free to pop questions into the chat. Um, I'll, I'll have a little outline of what we're going to cover too. So you might not want to be entering in a lot of questions about like what to compost because we are going to cover that. So maybe check and see what we're going to cover before um, asking a lot of questions just because we will go through all of them at the end um, as we have time. And this is recorded. And so um, that's because then we can share it later. And so, you know, as long as you keep your you know, picture off, you know, no people will be recorded in this. It's just so that anybody who couldn't make it tonight that was registered or or who would want to view it later can can have a chance to to join in too and learn how to start composting. All right. So composting 101. This is what we're going to cover tonight. I'm going to talk just really briefly about the impacts that composting has had um, through some programs I've worked on over the past year. Talk a little bit about why composting is awesome because it is. Um, and then really go through a lot of that general composting 101, just basic information, how to get started, how to pick a bin, what do you put in the bin, um, really, and then really go into some troubleshooting too that'll help you avoid some common mistakes. And we are going to give away three compost bins tonight. So I have a list of registered participants. I have a random number generator I'm going to use to just randomly select three numbers from that list. Um, but you have to be present to win. So the fewer people that actually show up, the better your odds are. So, um, and then and then again, time for that Q and A at the end. So let's get going. So I have answered probably hundreds of questions over the past year or two about composting, and and. Most of them get into the minutia of, oh, you know, is this okay to put in there or is this okay to put in here? Am I going to ruin it if I put in pine needles? You know, a lot, a lot of stuff where I think we need to think about the bigger picture. This happens in nature all the time. This is not some magical process that you have to get exactly right to, to be composting. That's really not what it is. Um, can you get really into the science of it and be very specific with it if you want to? Yes, but you don't have to. So really, composting can be super, super easy. It's going to happen anyway if you just put a bunch of stuff in a pile, like I did when I was growing up, and you just kind of leave it there. It will eventually break down. So you can just put your stuff in a pile and walk away and forget about it, and it will be still break down and have the benefits of composting. Um, so really, we don't need to be perfect here. Um, there was a great National Geographic article a while ago that was um, all about waste. And essentially, at the, at the end of every year, 90% of the stuff that we take from the planet and use, 90% of it becomes waste. 90% of what we use every year is waste. That's insanity. We can't keep doing that and expect to have a good future for our kids and grandkids. So we don't need to be perfect. We just need to take action and do something. And composting really is a high impact action. So I also field probably hundreds of questions every year about, you know, how do I recycle my tiny eyedrop bottle? Or can I really recycle the tiny scrap of tin foil on the top of my yogurt container? Or, you know, just again, I, I, and I will talk recycling all day, every day, but I think we get really hung up on 
some small stuff like that. And we, and we kind of lose, again, lose this sense of the bigger picture of really where are the big problems and what can we do about it? And food waste in the garbage is a huge problem. So if you want to make an impact, don't worry quite so much about the cap on the bottle or the cap off the bottle, start composting. That's another big action you can take that'll have a lot of impact. Um, and we've studied that. We do waste audits. The EPA also does waste composition studies. 25% or more of your garbage is compostable. So you could cut your waste by a quarter by composting. There's almost nothing else I can think of you could start doing tomorrow, you could start composting tomorrow, um, that would really have as much of an impact as composting would. And then, I'll explain this later, layer it like lasagna. All right. I might need to, let me just make sure you guys can see me. There we go. Okay. So a couple of notes about the impacts that composting has had. Um, so for the past couple of years, I've been managing our compost bin sale slash compost bin programs of various stripes. Um, last year, we did give out 500 backyard compost bins as part of a grant project um, to residents, primarily in Ottertail County, but a few made, it, made their way over to Wadena County. And as this was a grant project, we did have to have some data um, that was incorporated into it. So we, we asked participants to share with us how much they were composting. Um, and so this is really amazing. You know, I, I feel like we all have this idea that, oh, this little bit I'm doing doesn't really matter it really, really adds up. So just with the people in this program last year, people have collected over 21,000 pails of food waste in this program. That's amazing. And that's a very conservative estimate because not everybody responds all the time and not everybody can send that data to us consistently. Um, so likely that is much higher. So if we estimate that a pail of compost is about three pounds, and I think that's even on the low end, especially for my house, um, that's more than 60,000 pounds of food kept out of the garbage in less than one year. And that's just people doing it in their backyards. So this is a really high impact thing um, that, you, that you could start doing and, and just know that you're doing a really good thing. Um, so this is just an example of my full compost pail with some overflow because <laughs> we had a whole bag of moldy bread one day. Um, and so if you have a family of four, that's how big my family is, you could keep over 400 pounds of food waste out of the garbage each year, um, just with backyard composting. And it's likely more than that. That's kind of, again, trying to keep that estimate on the low side. That really depends on your own kind of cooking and eating habits. We tend to cook at home a lot and try to eat food, fruits and vegetables and whole foods. So, I mean, our pail might fill up kind of fast. Um, but again, if, if your leftovers don't get eaten or you have picky kids or friends over that don't eat their food, um, it really adds up quickly. Ottertail County also did start an organics recycling program. And while this is specific to, to Ottertail County, this program, um, I just want to share it just to, again, show a little slice of the impact that programs like this can have because of the amount of food waste we have. So we started this a year ago at 22 locations in Ottertail County healthcare, restaurants, and schools. This is actually a coffee shop shown here. All the food waste is collected in compostable bags, um, picked up by truck once a week. So here is a load that we collected last spring. It gets dumped out um, at this big compost facility where it's broken down over a course of a couple of months into new compost. Um, and so just again, in one year at just 22 places, that's not even that many, we've kept over 250,000 pounds of food out of the garbage. So um, food waste programs, composting programs can have really high impacts because a lot of your garbage is food. So why, why do this? Um, this to me really comes back to the impact that food waste has on the environment. Um, and so first, we always want to think about reducing food waste. And when we waste food, we waste all the resources that went into making it. Um, and so we feed landfills almost as, almost as much as we feed people. So we waste about 40% of the food we produce in the United States. Um, and, and most of it goes to a landfill. That's, that's really, none of this is going to composting programs. Um, that's not widespread enough yet. And we see it all the time in the, in the garbage, when, especially when we do these kind of waste audits where we sort garbage and study it kind of like science. 
Um, and it's really astonishing when most of that, or actually a lot of it could have been eaten. Um, when we've done waste sorts, waste audits, half of the food that we find could have been eaten. And I have a picture of that coming up. So we're just wasting a lot. Um, and, and it's feeding landfills. It's not feeding people. It's not going back into the soil. Um, it's not doing any good. We're throwing away money. So it can add up to about $1,500 a month if you're a family of four. And it's like dropping a bag of groceries in the parking lot whenever you go to the store. This is a great quote. Um, Dana Gunders wrote a whole food waste report for the Natural Resources Defense Council. It's actually really good reading. It's not too dry. Um, you can find that on their website. But this is a, a quote from her. Imagine walking out of a grocery store with four bags of groceries, dropping one in the parking lot, and not bothering to pick it up. That's essentially what we're doing in our homes today. Um, so you just think about how expensive groceries are now too. I think this $1,500 estimate was from probably five to 10 years ago. I would guess it's more like $2,500 now with cost of everything going up. So you really are wasting a lot of money when, when you're throwing out food that's not getting eaten. And we have studied that. So uh, when we do waste audits every other year here at the recycling center where I work, um, we actually take about four three to four tons of household garbage and we sort it by hand and kind of study it like science to see what are people throwing away? What could we help them with? Um, you know, what are things that might be confusing to people? So this is what's in the garbage, not what's in the recycling bin. So people still throw away recycling, that's too bad. Um, but over 25%, that big green slice is food waste that could have been composted. And half of that is food that could have been prevented from being wasted. This is not just trimmings and peels and apple cores. This is whole food still in packages, whole heads of lettuce, whole packages of celery, whole bags of grapes, packages of meat that haven't been touched. These are just some examples of things that we have actually found unopened packages of food that were either from a fridge clean out, a freezer clean out, a pantry clean out, People are not checking what they have at home before they go and buy more, and that's leading to a lot of waste. So we, that means we have a lot of opportunities at home to change our behavior and, and do better. Um, and we, I've done whole sessions on food waste. I won't really dig into how to prevent it this time, um, but even just knowing that it's happening to the extent that it's happening can, can be helpful. Another big impact of food waste is um, greenhouse gas emissions. So if food waste were a country, it would have more emissions than any other country except the US and China. So this is having big climate impacts um, and 14% of methane emissions in the US are from food waste, sitting in landfills, releasing methane. So it's a really serious environmental issue for, for a lot of different reasons, including this one. And 25%, so we have like 2% of water on the planet is fresh water very small amount and 25% of the fresh water that we have access to that's not stuck in a glacier, 25% um, is used on food that's never eaten because we're throwing it out. And so we just need to think carefully about what resources are we using to make that food? Because uh, that's what's going in the garbage. We're wasting those resources when we waste food. And we kind of do it because we can. I mean, food prices have gone up, but um, in the United States, Relatively speaking, now I know this is not true for everyone. This is a generalization. Uh, for some people, affording good quality food or having access to quality food is an issue. But for many people, food is abundant. It's cheap. It's accessible. You can go to the store and buy more anytime you want. Um, and you don't, you don't need to scrimp on it. You're not eating up every scrap because there's always more. Um, I mean, my fridge is packed full all the time. I also need to be better about that, but we have a lot and that leads to waste. Um, we're not very good at storing stuff at home, but also sometimes in more industrial environments or the retail sector, maybe things aren't being rotated in a store as much as they should be. There's a lot of issues around ugly food. And I think this is starting to change as people can subscribe to different services that bring them ugly food, maybe things where the packaging was damaged or produce that looks kind of silly. It's not the, not the right shape. Um, the picture here is a guy, Tristram Shandy, I believe his name is, or Stuart, Tristram Stewart. 
Um, and he made a documentary about food waste a while ago. That's a really good watch if you want to learn more. Um, and this was a whole load of bananas that had gotten rejected from some wholesale outlet because they weren't the right size or curvature or something. So there's all kinds of waste happening just because something's not quite up to spec, even though it's perfectly nutritionally sound. There's also a lot of confusion over date labeling. Um, most date labeling is it's, it's completely unregulated. So just because something says best buy doesn't mean that after that date, you can't eat it. And again, I won't go into great detail on that because um, we don't have enough time, but just this is stuff you could dig into more later if you were intrigued by it. And most people just don't realize it's happening. You dump it in your garbage, you kind of walk away and you forget it's happening. Um, but when you start to pile it all together and really look at it, it, it um, you start thinking about it a little bit differently. And so if you were gonna measure your food waste at home, you could look at it in that way. So you're not, it's not just disappearing into the garbage can, but when you're composting, the same thing happens where you're kind of adding it all up. It's not disappearing into the garbage. So you can have a better idea of what your family is wasting. And I've actually seen restaurants that do the large scale composting program with us. They actually say they like that because they notice how much product they're wasting. Cause that's their profit going down the drain or into the garbage can. Um, so it, it can be helpful and educational to really add up what you're, what you're throwing out. And so composting, that's what we're here for. And I know this, this is so silly. I can't help, help myself with some compost puns. Um, but if you ever, you know, I grew up hearing that beef, it's what's for dinner commercial. I, it's always stuck in my head, compost. It's what's after dinner. Um, and nature recycles. This is just nature recycling and it happens all the time. There's life in the soil, microorganisms, all kinds of decomposers that are digesting and eating dead and decaying organic matter all the time and turning it back into soil. That's happening all the time in nature. Um, and so we really need to return to using that. You know, a couple of decades ago or a couple of um, generations ago, we didn't really have food waste. We had chickens, we had compost piles, we had gardens. This is more of a, a new modern problem. And we need to go back a little bit and think about how we used to handle waste and, and we used to use it as a nutrient source and we should be doing that again. So composting will shrink your waste. Um, it will reduce your carbon footprint, return, return nutrients to the soil and it will make you feel good. There's a whole bunch of um, research on gardening and getting your hands dirty and actually even some of that contact with um, some of the microbes and stuff in the soil and smells even from the soil have a positive impact on your physical and mental health. So Hey, another good reason to compost. And compost isn't really a fertilizer necessarily. It's more of a soil conditioner. It's like a, a probiotic whole food for your soil. So it's going to release nutrients slowly. It's going to contain all kinds of different nutrients instead of just a few isolated um, nutrients in fertilizer like nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus. It's going to have a whole range of stuff that, that's going to lead to healthier soil, healthier plants. It can improve sandy soil and help it hold water. It can also loosen up really dense compacted clay or silt soil and, and improve the soil structure because it contains hummus. So that's like organic matter that um, doesn't decay as fast, but it can soak up water like a sponge and it also makes the soil a little more fluffy. And so it's also adding beneficial microbes that continue to break down organic matter in the soil continuing to make nutrients available over time. And composting is not a one size fits all thing. Um, so I've gotten questions too, like what's the right kind of compost, compost bin I should get? Well, it really depends on the space you have, your physical capabilities, you know, how much food waste you have, you know, do you live in the country? Do you live in town? So there, you have to really figure out what's going to work best for you. So if you live in an apartment, maybe, and you just have a little bit of food scraps, maybe you live alone or just as a couple, you might even just want composting worms in a small bin you could keep inside. And we have actually have some here. They're great. They don't smell. Um, they're kind of fun. So that's an option. If you are a gardener and you want lots and lots of usable compost, you're probably looking at multiple bins, stockpiling lots of leaves to add in with your food waste, maybe even like trying to get your neighbors to put food waste in for you so you can really build up a lot of a lot of compost. 
Um, a lot of people probably fall somewhere in the middle where you might fill up a bin over time um, and then need to empty it out at some point, but you're not, you're not really trying to have lots of compost, um, but you have food waste and you want to do the right thing with it and maybe have some compost for your garden. That's kind of where I would fit too. Um, you have to think about your unique situation and you have to think about how active you want to be. So some people get very involved and they want to be turning it and monitoring the temperature and making sure it's going really fast and being really specific with it. That's fine. If you want to do that, you can. Um, that would more likely be called hot composting. So you're going to be very actively managing and maintaining your compost pile. You're going to get compost done a lot quicker because you're going to make sure that um, Decomposing is happening at a pretty rapid rate, and that keeps the life in the soil really active, and bacteria are your main decomposer in compost. So you want to keep them stimulated and keep them going and be doing more mixing and turning. But it does not have to be that way. I think that's a common misconception that when you're composting, it needs to be perfect, and you have to get it to a certain temperature and stir it all the time. And you don't have to do it that way. There's also passive or cool composting. I would fit more in this category where I work, I have kids, I'm busy. I don't need compost right away. I don't want to be out there futzing with it all the time. It's just not me. That's not what works for me. Um, so I prefer the simpler approach. It's going to take longer, but I don't have to actively manage it. I, I rarely turn my compost and I'm okay with waiting a year or two. Um, well, it kind of sits there and just does its own thing. And so there's really this wide spectrum and, and some people might be on the active side and want stuff done quickly. And some people can be on the easy passive side and they're just okay with it happening at its own rate. So here's the basic steps of composting. So you're gonna get a bin and I'm gonna walk through some different bin types. Um, you're gonna collect scraps and you're gonna layer them like lasagna. I have my favorite composting diagram for that. Then you're gonna turn it or mix it. This could really be a lot of times. This could be one time. It really, again, depends on how active you want to be with it. And then you're going to use it. So, all kinds of bins with lots of opinions on different kinds of bins. Again, you're going to need to find the one that works for you in your situation. This is just a small sampling of bin options. Um, but in general, you should pick something that's going to have enough volume. That's what's going to let the microbial activity in there get high enough to get it to heat up and kind of decompose a little faster. The first option would be something free, like pick up four pallets um, or maybe make a three foot, you know, diameter circle out of chicken wire or, you know, that woven wire fencing. Um, so there's lots of free or extremely cheap DIY options. And this is really nice if, if you don't live in town and you don't need a cover on your bin and if a squirrel gets in there once in a while, not a big deal, um, this is fine. This will be totally adequate for you. You can just pull off a side. I wouldn't actually put the bottom in there. I don't like that, but it was just a picture of pallets I could show. I, I don't like the, pa the pallet in the bottom because then you can't really scoop there. But um, really easy. You can wire them together, screw them together, whatever. Scoop stuff right out of there. <clears throat> so I, I have one of these that I store leaves in. So, I mean, you still might want something like that, even if you have another bin. Once you have one compost bin, you're probably going to want another. Tumblers are really popular and I, I get lots of questions about them. They are not my favorite for a couple of reasons, but they might work for you, depending again on your situation. They tend to be very expensive, like a hundred dollars or more. Um, but they're neat. They're tidy. Um, you don't have to get in there with a pitchfork and do a lot of manual labor to turn it around. Some have two different sides. So you can have kind of two different batches of compost going at the same time. Um, but they tend to be a little too small in, in my, just my opinion. And I don't know everything about composting. You're not going to get the volume you need for it to heat up. Um, and you also, unless there's more than one compartment, you're always tumbling new stuff in with old stuff. And so it might be hard to get something that's a finished product out of it. But again, this, this might work for someone. It's just not the route I personally usually, usually would recommend. Um, you'd really have to do a little bit of research on your own to see if there's one that would work for you. There's also kind of a DIY tumbler idea where you find some sort of container you could enclose and then you could roll it down a hill or roll it with your foot. 
Um, and it would save you the pitchfork, not be very expensive, but this is gonna get really, really heavy. So if something like this is full of compost and you're having to roll it around, you have to keep in mind at some point, you're gonna have to like turn it back upright or um, I guess you could just take the lid off and dump it out. But just again, think of your physical capabilities and whether something heavy um, would work for you. You just wanna make sure to drill air holes. That one does not look like it has enough air holes. Really popular would be kind of stationary standing bins with covers. Um, this is what we have done for compost sales. Um, I one similar to this for the past, is this year three now or year four, I'm losing track. Um, they tend to be more moderately priced. They're not as expensive as a tumbler. They still keep things neat and tidy. They tend to have a large enough volume to get your compost heating up a little bit. Um, and, and they're easily accessible, like you could get one pretty easily. As an example, all three partner counties, Ottertail, Todd, and Wadena counties are going to be selling a bin very much like that, um, where it's just a stationary bin that sits on the ground, has a lid that locks on the top. These will be, be at transfer stations in all three counties starting April 29th. Um, and because of a wholesaler that we can buy in um, bulk from, they're only $40, that's a really good price. So, um, you know, you can head to a transfer station if you wanna get a bin, or if you wanna tell anybody else they should start composting, they could go get a bin. Um, and so there, there's no advanced sales. We've done that in past years, but it's really, really, really hard to get in touch with people after. Even if they've paid for a bin, some people just will not come and pick it up. So it's first come, first serve, you know, call your location and see if they still have some before you go. These bins measure, about three feet by three feet when assembled. They come in parts though. So like even if you have a compact car, you can usually get the whole thing in a back seat, which is really, really nice. You don't have to be driving a truck or having a trailer and they hold quite a bit and, and just they're, they're kind of a nice option. So we, we've had this one now, this will be our third year of offering it. And so far so good, they have clips that lock it together on the sides. Once you have your bin, or your pallets or your chicken wire, whatever you're using, choose a location that's convenient and that you have some space to maneuver around there because you might want to pull off a side, maybe lift a bin off the top to get at the compost inside. Um, sun or shade is not as important. I'm sure you could find opinions on either side if you go to the internet. Uh, that's not as important as just making sure that you can get to it and you actually can use it. So for example, in the winter, it's much harder to compost in Minnesota. If your bin is a hundred feet across your backyard or your lot versus, you know, 10 to 15 feet away, and you can easily maybe shovel a walkway to it all winter. Um, so just think about, you know, access year round, and then also where you're going to be using the compost when you're done with it. And then you don't want it in like a low marshy area that has standing water in it a lot of the time. You also don't want it up against, like with, with the compost directly on a building, especially one that's made out of wood, because that would start to decompose. So um, just be thoughtful about that. And then also we want to give composting a good name. So be, just be sensitive to your neighbors. This is an example of like the ordinance or guidelines or whatever from the city of Fergus Falls. This is pretty similar in some other towns I've seen, at least one foot from your property line. If you live in town, if you live in the country, this is probably not a big deal not within your side yard, like right next to someone else's yard or your front yard setback, and then 20 feet from someone else's house. Um, you know, you wouldn't want this like on your property line underneath your neighbor's bedroom window or something like that. So you're, maybe you get up on Saturday morning at seven o'clock and start stirring it up and nobody's gonna be happy about that. Okay, step two, you're gonna collect some scraps. And there are lots of options. Um, there are thousands of options to purchase a compost pail online. There, some are very fancy, some are more utilitarian. There's a lot of metal style buckets. Um, some have carbon filters in the top. It just needs to hold food scraps. So you really don't need to spend a lot of money. Ones you buy online usually run around $30. But I would really encourage you to go for something free or DIY or thrifted. So an ice cream bucket, uh, works really well. You could keep it in your fridge or freezer. Same goes for just a bag. You could keep in your fridge or freezer if you're worried about fruit flies or smell, especially in the summer as things get warm and there's more flies around. 
keep it in the fridge or freezer. And that'll really resolve a lot of those problems. Um, I wish I had brought it with me today. I have it sitting at home. I thrifted a really cute ice bucket. It's, it, it looks like a pail with a lid that you would put ice in to make drinks and stuff. And it's yellow and retro and it's so cute. I was like, oh, this would make the perfect compost bucket. But, um, or something out of the recycling bin that somebody has put cute craft paper around so you could get creative and, and kind of DIY your own. But there's lots of options. You know, if possible, try and use something you already have. You really don't have to have something um, that's actually labeled a compost bucket. It's just something you need to collect your scraps in that works for you. Then you're gonna, this is what you're gonna wanna collect. So um, this was also very confusing to me before I learned more about composting, green or brown or dry or wet or carbon or nitrogen. Ah, it all was kind of swimming in my head. So green stuff is wet stuff that's rich in nutrients or nitrogen. So that's anything that's like food waste, fruits and veggies, peels, pits, eggshells, grains, bread products, leftover pasta, some cut flowers, coffee grounds, tea leaves. Um, any kind of more food waste is going to go in that heavier, wet, green category. Anything else, which is usually yard waste, would be dry leaves. So the carbon stuff, this is the dry, brown, fluffy stuff. This could be dry leaves, wood chips, shredded paper, ripped up cardboard, straw, hay, anything that's gonna help add bulk and air into all that heavy wet stuff will work for this. Um, so I like to save my leaves. Many composters, once they get composting, also like to save their leaves in the fall so they have enough that will last them all year round. And you really need both of these. One of the most common mistakes that happens when people start composting is they load up, they collect all their food waste and they just keep dumping pail after pail after pail of food waste in their compost bin. And it causes a wet, slimy, stinky mess. Um, so I think that's just a really common problem. You have to balance out your food waste with some dry, brown, fluffy stuff that's rich in carbon um, because compost, is kind of a living thing. Decomposers in there are doing the work and they kind of need the same conditions that most life needs. They need some air, they need the right amount of moisture, they need a home and they need a food source. Um, and if they don't have air, it, it's gonna lead it to get smelly and nasty. And I'll go into that a little bit more in a bit. Try and stay away from large amounts of meat, oil, dairy products, and bones. Those things are more likely to attract pests like skunks or raccoons, and they're more likely to smell because they're so dense. They're also not going to break down as well in a backyard compost bin. If you're very experienced and you can monitor your compost really well and you know it gets really hot, um, you know, some people do this stuff at home. But if you're at all worried about pests or smell, try and keep this stuff to the bare minimum. Um, with that being said, if I have a bunch of leftover pizza or pizza crusts and there's some shreds of cheese on it, eh, that's not going to break your compost. You're not going to mess up your compost. If there's some oily dressing on a whole bowl of pasta salad in my fridge that went bad because nobody liked it, I'm going to put that in my compost bin. You just want to be careful about how much and you don't want to overload it with stuff that's not going to work very well. Ah! lasagna. Now you're going to layer it like lasagna. The reason I like this is because if you are more passive composting, this is going to help resolve a lot of problems and help your compost break down even if you do nothing else because your brown and green materials are going to be correctly distributed in your bin as you're adding them. You're not going to need to necessarily stir it to have stuff um, kind of distributed in the right way. So I like to start with my compost bin. I set it down on the ground. It's got an open bottom, which is fine. You can put some sticks in the bottom if you want, but actually touching the soil is fine because soil has lots of microorganisms that are go going to go up into the compost and start decomposing. So it's actually good if there's some contact there. You're going to start with a brown layer. then. Every time you dump your food waste pail in, 
you're going to add about three times as much dry, fluffy stuff. That would be your leaves, shredded paper, wood chips, etc. So you, at the end, once you've dumped in your pail of food waste, you put the brown stuff on top and then you walk away. So every time you put in your food waste, you always cover it with the layer of brown on top of it. This means that no food is exposed that's gonna smell or attract pests. And you're ensuring that every time you're adding enough brown, dry, fluffy stuff to balance out the heavy, wet nitrogen food waste, and you're gonna have the right ratio the entire time you're filling up your bin. So I do this until my bin is full to the top. This can take four to five months, depending on how, what the season and how quickly we're generating food waste. And that entire time, I don't touch it. I don't turn it, I don't mess with it. It just fills with layers of green and brown alternating and it will start decomposing. And you will see this, um, it will start decomposing and you'll be like, oh my gosh, my bin is getting full. I'm gonna have to empty it soon. And you go up, bring your pail out there three days later and it's dipped down six inches because the green and the brown are already intermingled in the right ratio. Composting is already happening even if you're not touching it in any other way, you're just continuing to add stuff in layers on top. So this is really key, especially if you don't wanna monkey with your compost a lot. You can layer like this and never turn your bin once unless it's full and you need to empty it out. So it's just kind of good news if you want composting to be easy, this is gonna be really helpful for you. Then once it's full, or if you're more active and you wanna mix it up more, but for me, it's when my bin is full, then you're gonna mix it up. You're gonna to wanna to distribute kind of any stuff that's not broken up or broken down yet. When you stir it, it's gonna get new food sources to the microorganisms and decomposers in your pile. It's gonna help bring air into some pockets of food that were maybe still a little wet. It's gonna help distribute moisture. The edges are probably more dry than the center. Um, and it's just gonna kind of boost up decomposition again a little bit. And there's different ways to do it. So the guy on the left is doing kind of the classic, I've got a pitchfork, I'm gonna scoop and I'm gonna kind of stir it around. You can do that. Um, I find it very, very difficult to get to the bottom though. So that's, that's not how I do it, but a lot of people do it like that. That's fine if it works for you. We do have a compost ball here that we use for kids groups, which is very fun, but it's very heavy. So like it takes like four or five kids to, to turn this thing to stir the compost. So again, remember how heavy some of this is gonna get if you wanna have something you're gonna roll on the ground. But at some point you will mix it up and maybe it's just that one time if you're the passive composter. This is how I do it. I just wanted to show a video because it can be kind of hard to describe. So I have a couple of different styles of bins in my backyard. You can see in the background, the pallet, um, free pallets I picked up. I use that as an enclosure for uh, leaves that I use then all the rest of the year. So I pull the entire bin off. And if you get the one from us, it actually has the clips. You would undo the clips on the sides, open the bin and then lift it off. And you end up with the whole stack, all the lasagna layers that you've put in there over the past four, five, six months, whatever it might be, all stacked up there. Then you can either put your same bin next to it and scoop and turn stuff back over into a new container or into that same container. Or um, I usually turn it into something else, either a square of pallets or a circle of like kind of, you know, woven wire fencing, because I want to start lasagna layering into that covered bin again. So I'm going to, once it's full, I want to free that up. So I'm going to turn this whole stack essentially upside down into a different container. That's going to mix it up. If it seems too wet and smelly when I'm turning it, because it, it does smell a little bit when you turn it. Um, it shouldn't really smell much the rest of the time. You shouldn't walk by it and faint over or something. Um, so I'm going to flip that into a different bin so I can start lasagna layering in my covered bin again. Because once it's half broken down, pest issues and smell are usually not as much of a problem. So it can be in something open and I don't really experience issues anymore at that time. Here's a, here's a little more like digging in deeper. Don't worry if you wanna be the easy passive composter. You don't have to memorize all this. You don't have to do a moisture test. But for those that wanted to get a little more involved um, and 
I don't know. I have a science background. I kind of like the sciencey parts of it too. Sometimes you can check for moisture. One way to do that is a moisture squeeze test. So you can have a, a handful of compost that's mostly broken down and it should feel damp, slightly wet, but not drippy. So if you were to squeeze that and moisture runs down your hand, it's too wet and, and it might be gross and smelly and you might not want to put it in your hand anyway, in which case it's probably too wet. It, if you squeeze, it should form kind of a ball and stay stuck together when you open your hand, like the bottom right. If it kind of crumbles apart and flakes apart really easily, it's probably too dry and you could add some water. Rainwater is best or water that's left out to sit so it can de off gas any chlorine that was in it from like a municipal supply. Also, it's helpful to know the difference between aerobic and anaerobic decomposition. These are just fancy words for with oxygen and without oxygen. So in a landfill environment, there's no oxygen. Waste is packed in there, sealed away in a really tight environment. There's really no air getting in there. So that would be an anaerobic environment. Composting requires air. So that's out. That's why you want the dry, fluffy stuff in there. That's with oxygen. Landfills are made to store stuff, not decompose stuff. This is trash that's sealed away. And, and I meet a lot of people that think, oh, food in a landfill is just going to break down. It's just going to decompose. Well, it's sealed so tightly with no air and it's locked away from nature. It's not really decomposing in the way that it would in a compost pile or in the forest or something. Um, back, the bacteria that can survive in that environment are anaerobic bacteria. They can survive without oxygen and they produce methane as a byproduct. That kind of decomposition also happens very, very, very slowly and the food is almost mummified. So it's not decomposing back into dirt and re-entering the environment to build soil. It's trapped in there forever, kind of mummified. Composting takes nutrients from organic waste and uses it to feed the life in the soil. The microbes and other decomposers are gonna consume compounds in that waste and then secrete products that become nutrients for growing plants. And then also there's a lot of invertebrates and insects and stuff that help break down larger pieces. So beetles, bugs, things like that. Don't worry about this. If you don't wanna worry about temperature of your compost and when to turn it, don't worry. But if you wanted to get into temperature of your compost, this is the slide for you. Compost heats up over time because of an increase in the activity of thermophilic bacteria. So they're generating heat as they're getting really, really active in the compost pile. This is when they're consuming most of the easily broken down compounds and food waste or whatever they happen to be eating. So they're very, very active. Then once those easily consumable compounds are, are all used up, that activity and temperature will go down. So you can see on this curve, there's a peak at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. Oh no, that's Celsius on the side, sorry. 70 degrees Celsius, so that'd be, I don't know, 150 Fahrenheit, something like that. And then it tapers back off down and that, that's the same as the bacteria activity decreasing once they've consumed most of the material in there that's, that they're eating. So in the chart on the right, you can see that as temperature starts to peak at point A, it's going to start to then go down as all the easily consumable stuff is used up. If you were to turn it, then temperature spikes again because you've kind of stirred it up, redistributed food, moisture, and, and microorganisms, and they have a little more food again. So turning it can cause your temperature and decomposition to boost up again. And so you can turn it to stimulate faster decomposition, but you don't have to. Um, and even if you're not turning it all the time, there's a little picture here of my compost thermometer. This might be useful for you. Um, you can buy them easily online. But they have a little cheat guide on there that tells you when your compost is you know, active or not. And so this was in, taken um, in a bin last spring that hadn't been turned in five months. Hadn't touched it. It had just been la lasagna layered into the bin until the bin was completely full. And when it thawed out in the spring, 
It was in the active phase because decomposition was boosting back up again as it got warm. Um, and I hadn't turned it at all. So again, you can be very passive with do the layering and it will heat up and it will be an active compost pile that's decomposing. But if you wanted to, once you saw the temperature start to slack off a bit, you could turn your stuff and it would boost your microbial activity, your decomposition, and your temperature would go up again. So, but again, don't worry about this. You don't have to know this to be composting. And there's all kinds of compost critters in compost. Nature thinks is stuff is alive. So um, it's not gonna just sit there perfectly and decompose all by itself. There's gonna be bacteria, mold, bugs, flies, maybe maggots. Even if you're not putting any gross meat stuff in there, there's gonna be bugs. There's gonna be spiders that are gonna be preying on other bugs. There's gonna be worms. It's just, that's nature. Um, it's, it's not sanitized. Um, and so I get a lot of people that are very concerned that there's flies in their bin or there's mold in their bin. Well, maybe you don't want that inside, but outside that is actually nature recycling. That's decomposer's job is to go into dead and decaying organic matter and break it down. And it requires microorganisms and insects to do that. So just be expecting that. That's a normal part of it. Now is a good time if you have a question about anything I've talked about to put them in the chat and I will go in and cover those in a little bit. Um, I will, while you think about your questions and pop them into the chat, I'll talk through three troubleshooting scenarios that are probably one of the most likely to pop up. So if your pile or in your bin is really wet or it smells terrible, like gross rotten eggs, maybe sour smelling, something like that. It's probably too wet. You probably don't have enough dry stuff um, and you probably have exposed food waste. And so you can turn your pile, introduce some air into there. It, if, it, if it smells, it's, it's gonna smell while you're turning it, but you can still fix it. You have not failed at composting if this has happened. You can correct it anytime. Um, it has just gone a little anaerobic. It's going to smell because there's no oxygen and those anaerobic bacteria that can exist in that environment are releasing methane as a byproduct and it's going to smell nasty. So turn your pile, mix it up a little bit, add some brown stuff, add more leaves, add straw, add wood chips, make sure it's not too wet and then leave it for a while and, and it'll be fine. On the other side, I have seen people that struggle to get their compost pile to decompose at all. Um, maybe it just stays cold. It won't heat up. Nothing's happening. Likely your pile is too small. I did have that happen where somebody emailed me a picture of their compost pile last year and they're in their bin that they had got from us. And they're like, it's not, nothing's happening. I feel like I'm doing something wrong. Well, in the bottom was just a very small pile of twiggy stuff with a few food scraps in it. And there just wasn't enough volume there to get enough decomposition happening. There wasn't enough material for microorganisms, primarily bacteria and mold to really go to town on it. Um, Cause if you have a really small mass, it's gonna dry out really easily. So it looked dry and twiggy and quite small. So don't worry, just keep layering stuff into your bin. Keep piling it up. It will eventually have enough mass to start breaking down. So make your pile larger. Maybe you ask your neighbor to give you from some food scraps. You know, maybe you don't generate food scraps very quickly at your house. Good for you. Um, you could also add insulation on the outside if you wanted to. Maybe pile some bags of leaves around your bin to give it some extra cushion. Um, add some water if it's too dry. And then add more nitrogen. So that could be more food scraps, green grass clippings, coffee grounds. You could go to your local coffee shop and ask for coffee grounds, they'd probably be delighted to give them to you. That'll give another boost of nitrogen. I also have somebody who is a free source of straw with like goat droppings in it, and they're willing to have people come pick it up at their house. That would also kickstart a pile that's not going or not heating up because that's going to be very nitrogen heavy or hot, like chicken manure, goat manure, rabbit manure. That kind of thing is safe to put in there and it would help heat it up quickly. Your pile is attracting animals. This is probably the number one concern I hear about is, I don't want pests around. <laughs> and I totally get that. 
Um, but keep, keep this in perspective though. So we have a massive food waste problem and we need to do something about it. And so just be a little aware of like, we don't want a lot of pests like in our home or something, but you might have animals that want to be around your compost bin. And that's, that's not the end of the world. Um, if, if it's still a good way to handle our food waste, you know, don't worry if mice want to get in there once in a while, they're outside, they're not in your house. They're looking for shelter and food. You can't really blame them. Um, but that being said, you don't want animals crawling in there all the time or causing problems. So it's likely that your pile contains too much meat or dairy, which are going to smell a lot more and they're going to break down really slowly. Or you're not putting the brown layer on top of your food scraps and they're not covered. So you want to, if you're in an area where you don't want animals coming in, maybe you live in town or you live in the country and you just don't want animals getting in there, use a covered bin, something with a lid. You can also enclose the entire bottom with a layer of hardware cloth or that one quarter inch metal mesh. Make sure you're covering your foot, food with some kind of brown material. Um, that's probably the biggest thing. So these are all best practices. And sometimes that's just not life. And that's okay, you haven't failed. So this winter, I did not put enough leaves in my bin. I layered in my bin all winter, but at some point my leaf pile froze so solid because of the wet, there was like wet snow and then a heavy snow. And I just could, I just gave up on trying to dig my leaves out from under it. I'll get smart one of these years and put a tarp on far enough ahead of time. But I did not have leaves for the past couple of months to put in my bin. And I will just, it will smell a little bit more when I turn it, but I will incorporate more leaves when I'm turning it over later and I can fix that. So again, don't, don't be afraid that you've somehow messed up composting because you can usually fix something if, if it hasn't been ideal. And then once it's done and it kind of, there's no large visible pieces of food waste anymore. It's dark, crumbly, kind of smells like garden soil. This could be a very variable time frame, depending on if you're hot, active composting versus passive composting. It could be like a month or it could be a year. You have to just kind of use your senses and, and how you've been doing it to determine that. Um, but it should smell like soil. It shouldn't smell like food. It shouldn't look like food. It should be crumbly and dark. You can screen out big chunks for a better texture. Things like pits, avocado peels, twigs. Um, like nut parts. Some things are so hard, they're not gonna break down very easy and they might remain in your compost. And you can put it on a screen as shown in the picture and kind of sift out the fine stuff and use that and toss the twiggy hard stuff back in to let it keep breaking down. Once you have it how you want it, I use it twiggy. Some people might wanna sift it so they can mix it into potting soil. You can mix it into garden beds or top dress just on top of the soil. You can rake it over low spots in your line, lawn. Like maybe you don't have a garden, but you have compost. You can rake it over your lawn. You can mix it with potting soil. You can even use it as mulch, especially if it's kind of rough stuff. I mulch around the base of shrubs with it. Um, so it'll keep giving some nutrients, but it's also kind of twiggy. So it looks a little bit more like mulch. So there's lots of ways you can use it. You could even give it away if you really just want to take care of your food waste and compost, but you don't need the compost. I'm sure someone would take it off your hands. Again, key takeaways from the beginning. It's easy if you let it be easy. You can make it complicated. You can have a thermometer. You can turn it all the time, but you don't have to. It can be very easy. It will happen even if you don't do it perfect. Um, it will still compost. Composting is high impact. It makes a huge difference if you do it. Um, so. Anytime anybody asks me, you know, what, what else could I be doing if they don't already compost, I would say start composting. And then don't forget to layer it like lasagna because that's going to solve a lot of your other problems. It's going to give you the right balance of the two different kinds of materials you need. Green, wet food waste and dry, fluffy brown stuff. Layering those is really, really going to help you. So what can you do? I'll feed the landfill your compost bin instead. Try to reduce your food waste. There's lots of information online. Um, again, didn't go into that today, but once you start composting, you're going to notice how much you're wasting, and that's going to be helpful to know. 
Compost what you can't eat, of course. Keep your compost bin tidy. Um, you know, when I first started composting and I lived in town, squirrels kept getting in there because I didn't have a lid and they were strewing stuff around. There were like onion peels everywhere. I'm like, okay, I got to get a bin with a lid because I don't want my neighbors to complain. I want this to be tidy and look like it has a place in my yard and, and not be a nuisance. And also just, I want a clean yard too. You can actually leave some of your leaves on the ground too. They will slowly break down into your yard and give it a nutrient boost. Um, and then that also helps support wildlife and pollinators and then helps spread the word. So if you know somebody that you think might wanna start composting, you can share this with them or let them know about the compost bin sale or help them out. I know somebody that turns their neighbor's compost because their neighbor can't. So we can all help compost more. All right, it's time for the compost bin giveaway. And then I will get to the questions in the chat and answer the first question in chat. Okay. So the first question is, does the compost process release the CO2 the plant has captured during its lifetime? Ooh, that's almost too sciencey for me. I'm gonna have to go look that up. I mean, any kind of decomposition is gonna release something, but most, okay, it's, it's coming back to me now, but I'd have to look up the more sciencey answer. Composting helps capture carbon because plants store carbon in their structure. That's why like leaves are dry carbon rich materials. So you're actually help, helping incorporate carbon back into the soil by composting. Some may be released, what that percentage is, I don't know. That's something you could probably look up. Um, but in general, composting would have a net positive impact on, on capturing more carbon than, than it's gonna release. That's a, that's a good question, that's a tough one. Someone said, can you add paper? How small does cardboard need to be? Um, you can add paper. Usually I recommend that only in a pinch. Um, like you don't have any leaves because you just started composting and it's spring and leaves were last fall and you didn't think to save any because you didn't know you were gonna be composting. So in a pinch, paper will work. Um, the smaller it is, the easier it will be to fluff up. If you can imagine like lots of sheets of newspaper that got wet and stuck together would create a mat that would really seal in moisture and not be very fluffy. So you want it ripped up somewhat. That's a great job for kids, by the way. Um, if it's cardboard, I would rip it into like one inch strips or two inch strips or something and then kind of fluff them up a little bit. Ideally stuff that's not heavily printed with colored inks. Again, in a pinch, it's not going to ruin your compost, but ideally I like leaves because you know there's no chemical, no bleach, no ink, etc. Um, but you can add paper and I do recommend that if somebody just doesn't have leaves. Go back. Okay. Can you add paper? Um, similar paper question. If you add paper, does it matter if it's printed paper or glossy paper? If you literally have nothing else, probably any paper will work, but I would stick to the plainer, the better. Newsprint, um, brown paper bags, uh, cardboard, things that aren't so printed and, and finished because anything that's glossy is going to have more chemicals and stuff on it. Still not. Awesome. Well, congratulations, everybody. Woo okay, last couple of questions. If people need to leave, they certainly can leave. I'm gonna put my contact information up here. Um, I will answer questions about composting and recycling pretty much all, all the time. Okay, not the middle of the night, but if you call me or email me, I'm happy to talk about it, happy to answer questions. Um, kind of your general recycling and composting help desk right here. So feel free to contact me. There's that info as I go back into the chat. Again, another question about paper, kind of following up on that. Newspaper, plain cardboard, brown paper bags would be the best. Um, ink, yeah, anything that's gonna be more processed and have more chemicals, it's gonna be in your compost. Some people are gonna be really finicky about this. Some people are gonna just need some brown material. So when possible, try and use leaves, wood chips, something more natural in a pinch, newsprint, cardboard, plain paper, nothing too glossy.
Cause yeah, it'll, it'll be in your dirt. It'll be in your soil. So, you know, how much of that goes into food you would grow is probably really hard to know, but someone is asking, you mentioned that goat or chicken manure can be helpful and is safe for composting. What would be dangerous to add to a compost pile used for gardening? That's a really good question. So you can actually compost um, like dog waste. I wouldn't recommend cat waste because there's more pathogens in that, but you can compost dog waste, you, but I would not recommend doing that in with any compost that would touch food. Um, so really I would keep pet waste out of there unless it's from like herbivores. So goat manure, um, rabbit manure and chicken manure are usually fine as long as they're getting fully broken down and you're not like right away going to spread them on a vegetable garden or something like that. That's fine. And that's a good boost. If you want to heat your compost up and get it going, that's great. Somebody is asking, did you say that pine needles could be used as the brown ingredient or are they too acidic? I think this is one where um, I get asked about like lemon rinds and orange peels and things like that, that also tend to be acidic. And I think it's kind of one of those things where you need to balance it out with something else. So I wouldn't use all pine needles for my brown stuff or maybe some lemon peels or lemon rinds, something, whatever you call them would be okay. But if you're making enough lemonade for a wedding and you have 50 buckets of, you know, lemon rind or something, well, maybe you'd want to spread that out a little bit. So it's okay to put that stuff in there. You just don't want to overload your bin with it because they might change the pH a little bit. I've heard varying opinions on pine needles. Some people say don't do it at all, but um, I really think if it's mixed in with everything else, it's not going to be an issue. I've even read some sources that say they're not really going to change the pH at the end of the day very much at all once they're broken down. All right. Well, that's it for the questions. I'll hang out for just a minute here in case there's more. Thank you so much for joining in for Composting 101. Reach out anytime. Go get a bin at your closest transfer station in Ottertail County, Wadena County, or Todd County. Supplies are finite. So go early and get your bin. And if you're a couple of days after the start, maybe just check your location to make sure um, that they would still have a bin available for you. Thanks so much.